this week's subject, we're going to move into company level drills. And with this COVID thing, uh, I think we're all finding ourselves with more time in the engine house. Uh, so it's kind of up to us. Are we going to sit around and eat eight meals a day and watch TV? Or are we going to use this time to maybe get some drilling in and training? Uh, you know, talking to Sanders before we started this thing. You know, all their PR has been canceled. All their building inspections have been canceled. All the stuff that fills up our days. I mean, we can't even go to the store or anything uh, on our job. So we have all this time. We're bringing in all our own food and uh, we're stuck in the engine house basically the whole day. Uh, we, we can go out in our still and, and whatnot, but um, as long as you're not around people. So uh, we wanted to talk about company drills, you know, simple drills we could do in-house or maybe in the parking lot or in a vacant building. Um, we kind of, this all came about from uh, last week. Chad uh, kind of gave the simple drill of using a pillowcase and a tick. Um, I know everybody on the podcast today was not here last week. So Chad, I want to start off with that simple drill. Um, uh, we could go a little bit into the importance of drilling, but by the fact that there's 32 of us on here right now, I, I think that's beating a dead horse with this group. But uh, Chad, let's let's start off with the simple tick drill, and then we'll go from there and uh, uh, see what kind of drills we could come up with uh, over the next hour and a half or so. Hour. So you're wanting to know about what kind of drills you can do with thermal imaging, right? Uh, drills in general, Chad, like uh, some good quarantine drills. I know you've been – stuck at home and not at work with your guys, but any, any good ideas for drills that, uh, you know, people could do during this time uh, to kind of kill the time of quarantine and, and uh, till we get back to business as usual. Yeah, there's one, um, especially if you're stuck in your station, that definitely makes it challenging. We've taken advantage of doing a lot of uh, rescue type stuff. So um, like a sleeping dragon, you can set up a protester prop. Uh, we spent a day doing that, uh, you know, cutting people's arms out of a concrete bucket, you know, that are handcuffed together, chained together, whatever. Uh, something that can be done easily. And uh, what else have we done? Oh, um, we were able to figure out how to set up uh, like a, a quick high anchor for a down firefighter. Um, a simple, uh, uh, either a two to one or a change of direction off top of a ladder. So you can put a ladder, ladder above a window and carabiner a, a pulley to it, throw the rope in the basement, pull a guy out of the basement door, have a hole in the floor. We're able to simulate stuff like that at the station. Some different risk scenarios can be done. Definitely drags and carries. I think the uh, one of the number one things the fire service has failed at when it comes to training is teaching someone the hardest thing you'll ever do on this job is to drag it a lifeless body out of a fire. Uh, I, I'd venture to say that most of us, including myself up to a few years ago, was ill-prepared to ever do that. And uh, so that's something that can definitely be done. I've, I've gone as far to uh, 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 strip down nothing but my underwear in my, in my bed at the station, fill the hallway up with chairs, and uh, call, call everyone upstairs in full turnout in order to get me out of the bedroom and down the stairs. Uh, anyway, it's really is you just got to use your imagination and what's applicable to you and, and the level your company's at as to how far you can take your training. But uh, there's a few ideas there. I'm sure some other people got some more to say on it. Paul, I got one question. Uh, did you play wow. the senior man? Did you play the senior man card when you came upstairs and Chad was in his underwear? Did you make all them young guys drag him out? Uh, we all, we all did it. Um, no, it, it it, it definitely caught me off guard, but uh, but we all we all participated in it. It does it does bring a different element to it. Um, it's really hard to simulate a complete lifeless body. I mean, as hard as we uh, really try to train, you know, all the mannequins and everything that we get, it is really hard to to simulate a a, a true lifeless body. Just trying to get your grips in and everything else, and not dropping somebody. I mean. Even guys around the station, they, they want to lay there lifeless, but the muscle rigidity is still there, and it still helps out the situation. I mean, we try our best at what we do, but uh, um, but it, it's just going over and over and over and over and, and repeating the techniques. So, 
so when we do actually have somebody that's lifeless, uh, hopefully the technique that we practice on works, and they have. So, but no, I didn't pull the senior man card. I could just see RC. No, nah, you drag, you drag, uh, you guys, you young guys drag them out. I'm not doing that. So, um, <laughs> You know, big departments, uh, senior man's almost like a rank, and you, you get your own privileges based on that. Uh, the, the awesome uh, – Uh-oh. Hopefully we don't lose our host. It's on as well. So, Gary uh, – my connection is kind of slow right now all of a sudden, but um, Gary, Hey, you, you want to throw out some company level drills and then we'll, we'll, we'll kick it out to some of these other guys. Uh, I, I'll eventually work it back to um, the firefighter level and what, what makes us uh, thrive as firefighters and what kind of training we want to see just kind of to have a well-rounded uh, picture. But what do you got for us, Gary? You know, one of the biggest things that we talk about a lot of times, and it doesn't matter, you know, whatever, whatever your primary job function is, whether it be your, you know, you're on an engine, a truck or rescue or, or whatever, or it's, you're on a unit that you don't have designated companies, you know, wh what's your basis fundamental of what you're required to do on the job? Uh, you know, whenever everybody wants to get into some of the more technical aspects of it and, and again, if you're on a rescue or something, that's a little bit more applicable to what you do. But if you're on an engine company, if you can't deploy your line properly, then that's what you need to constantly be training on going upstairs, going downstairs, going to the rear of the building, the, the inch and three quarter, the two and a half, you know, you've got all of those things. If you can't do your fundamentals efficiently, then that's what you need to be spending the most of your time on and not one of the things sometimes that becomes a little bit more of a challenge for people is find different places and different ways to do it. Create problems for yourself because whenever you have a training session, that's, that's where you want to screw this up. Um, and by screwing it up, then you create a avenue of problem solving. So as you go through and you're doing your practice, and you're doing your drill and all of a sudden our line doesn't deploy effectively, effectively, then what then we need to do is come back and, uh, uh, practice doing that and it, it helps us to, to solve that problems. If you're having a problem with throwing ladders, you know, going out and, and get the fundamentals of throwing ladders. Uh, don't just throw them on where you have a flat parking lot, practice putting them on inclines, grades, which a, a lot of this stuff, Jared could go in a little bit more detail of, but the biggest thing that I found that where we lack in the fire service is being extremely comfortable and intimate with our fundamentals of what we need to be able to do. Uh, even our SCBAs, you see people struggling at the front door, putting on their SCBA, practice putting on your mask, you know, without doing that kneel down and taking a prayer in the front yard, look up, get your head up where you're looking at your building as you're putting your mask on practice doing stuff with your gloves. Um, actually, you know, one of the things that I, I have found myself to be, you know, do, get another spare of the spare set of gloves where you can do everything with a pair of gloves on. Um, even if we're doing some type of a training, starting a piece of equipment, Keep your gloves on because if you become comfortable with doing stuff with your gloves on, then it becomes second nature to you. you. You see guys all the time whenever you're doing training drills. And one thing I started kind of doing is we were doing drill, drills and trainings in-house. Um, let, let guys watch because then they kind of see what other people are doing. You'll notice one of the things, especially when you start getting into grit drills or really get somebody uncomfortable, for some reason, and it seems like the first thing they do is they, they start shedding gloves. Their gloves are coming off. Uh, so if, if we're, we're getting comfortable with those gloves, again, that's a, that's a general fundamental of what we do is keeping our gloves on and practicing with those. So I think it all comes back to, you know, what is your baseline fundamental? Um, and don't be too proud to say, you know what? I suck at this. I, I need to go out and practice this. Whether you're a brand new firefighter, you're the company officer, you're a chief officer, whatever. Don't be too proud to say, I need some help with my skills and then go out and practice it. Don't, don't be afraid to go to the younger person or the person with, with lesser seniority. Go out, go out and practice with them. They probably have something that they can probably teach you and vice versa. And then it actually the bottom line to it also is it gets you a little bit closer with that individual personally. So it's kind of, you know, my, my biggest push is always the fundamentals. Yeah, I think that's great. And uh, I just want to remind everyone, uh, if 
you're uncomfortable unmuting yourself and talking, you know, and something that's going to get post out there for all to see. Uh, Tim Schultz runs our, um, runs our chat board. So go ahead and uh, fire away your questions there. He'll make sure we get them answered uh, on the air. Um, I just want to, I think the most important thing we could do is get good at working with firefighter gloves on. You could come off the truck with them on and really you should never have to take them off. Um, I will kick this to Chad in a second because I know he's done some interesting modifications. Those guys on Res Rescue 9 there in KC have done some interesting modifications to make it faster, but I'm at least a firm believer in mask it up with your gloves on. Uh, no matter what you do, it's going to be a lot quicker, um, at least with one glove on at the minimum. Um, and the best way to practice that is come in in the morning and when you, when you do your morning check, put your coat on and your hood and practice masking up. You know, and also your the tanks on your back while you're checking it and you're not developing muscle memory uh, where you're sitting there staring at the tank and everything's opposite as it what it's going to be when you have it on your back. Uh, you know, it just takes a few weeks of doing it 10, 15 times a day when you do your morning check on your SCBA. I, I know when I first started it, for whatever reason, some of the departments I worked at, uh, the guys – the driver would check everyone's air pack, um, you know, on, on my department and since then, cause we've lost guys due to SCBA problems uh, as a big factor in that is everyone checks their own tank. And if you're not checking your own equipment and your SCBA in the morning, like uh, that's a pretty big problem at this point. But uh, back to the whole point of getting good at masking up with your gloves on Chad, Paul, um, What's your feelings on that? And I, I know from being there and, and uh, working with you guys, uh, you know, teaching or being friends, that you guys have some modifications you've done to make that more efficient. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jeff, I got I have two or three more things come to mind that are good drills that we enjoyed. Um, so I'll answer that, then I'll throw those out there real quick. Um, and really, I think we're – I think most of the fire service has uh, – uh, We've evolved, they've evolved through the videos and the training I've seen, where we're pretty much on board with the same thing. Um, I used to cut a hole in my hood so it fit up tight against my neck and it hung on my face piece. Um, because we're testing out new hoods, um, I changed and I'm doing that common video where you take your face piece, take your, take your lid off, where it hangs on your arm on the strap, mask up, know how to pull your hood up with your thumbs and get a good seal, which is a real challenge you got to go from thumbs to fingers or you're not going to seal here and you'll have that cool burn that everyone wants to have right outside the face piece which is stupid so um uh other than that uh like gauntlet gloves they used to issue us they wouldn't give us gauntlet gloves so we cut it off because we had the thumb the the thumb deals so we would cut the gauntlet off leave a piece of leather just a lot of little stuff that really uh uh people need to figure out they need to play, like you said, do it every day, figure out that little stuff for themselves. Hopefully we're here to keep them from getting the detached retina from the flashlight hanging on their chest and the major stuff, but you learn by doing it. Uh, one thing we found when it came to proficiency with masking up, with your gloves on, blacked out, uh, we found a room in the station uh, that was zero visibility. We'll take uh, four or five air packs in there, mix them all up, a couple of them will be empty throw them all in a pile, half of them will be on, half of them will be empty, they're all screaming and, and, and going off. We all go into that room, close the door, zero visibility, everyone has to get a face piece and a face mask, put it together, put it on. Then you gotta figure out which one of the two of you don't have air, start buddy breathing. Then if you wanna go beyond that, you can slap the cellophane on top of your face pieces, open the door and the two guys without air and the two guys with air and take off walking. And I'd really recommend doing stairs. And I'd recommend sometime in your career doing that in live smoke because it was well over, it was at least 15 years before I did it in live smoke. And I, I desperately failed, almost had to be rescued. Uh, so there's nothing that will replace uh, buddy breathing and live smoke. And of course, buddy breathing has a bunch with our buddy breathing lines and stuff if you have those. So that's one drill, throw all the air packs, in a dark room, go in there, unbuck it, get them all back on. Um, another one that was a good, that w we actually had pretty fun with, is 
just get a, get 100, 150 foot of feet of hose and send everyone inside except for one or two people and stretch that hose. It doesn't even have to really be charged. We, we, we would fill it with air, but take it underneath the rig, take it through the next rig, take it through the back of the chief's buggy and out the driver's door, take it through the middle of that tire that all the macho guys like flipping around the station, put it through the middle of that tire. And uh, I think we even took it up over the lockers. And then you have two uh, people come in in pairs of twos uh, with zero visibility or minimal visibility, usually the cellophane or whatever is what we use. And they got to follow, it's a simple follow the hose line. And it's not really, uh, for that purpose, it's not the skill of knowing how to follow a hose line. It's when you go underneath that rig, you're probably going to have to take your air pack off and slide it in front of you. And if it's not wrapped around your hand, I'm going to rip it and the face piece off of you as you come underneath that rig. Um, you're going to have to put your halligan down so you can jump up on the locker. You're going to have to reach down and grab your buddy and help him get on top of the locker so you can get over it. Uh, uh, shit, I think they finally, after I got done uh, harassing the guys with these uh, strenuous exercises, I said it was one up for me. So uh, they actually took it over the rig. And, it, and we got a call before I could do it, but uh, I think I would have been able to do you would have been able to do it, but it would, it'll really build confidence and get you where you can take your, take all your equipment on and off, uh, the, where you feel comfortable with your tools and you got to work with your partner if you're doing it together. Uh, one last drill I can think of. There I am. Uh, I got to go over here and show you. I forget where, where I heard, or heard this from or got this idea from, uh, one of these, uh, things that they measure, uh, distance with. Uh, this goes out to, uh, I don't know, like several hundred yards, se several hundred feet. Um, you could take this, and especially for a younger guy, you roll it on the ground, it, it tells you uh, where to go. Uh, there it is. You roll that around, it tells you how it, it tracks the distance without having to lay a hundred foot tape down two or three times. It real easily does the distance. So yeah, it'd be great to go out in the field and do that if we're not all quarantined. But you can do that in the station, especially for a new guy, and decide, are you starting at the curb? Or are you starting at the front door? How far is it to the kitchen? How far is it to the chief's office or the captain's office? How far is it to the back door? Because there's an attached building. This is our only entrance. So it's a good way to uh, try to determine stretches and engine tape. All right, somebody else go. So along that note, Chad, without uh... – I mean, take it off spotlight, but um, yeah. I've seen people do the same thing with uh, little twine. They get 200 feet of twine because uh, without yeah. going too much, without going too much into uh, engine ops, you know, um, the bread and butter of the, the American Fire Service is 200 foot, inch and three quarter, inch and a half pre connects. I mean, that's what we do. So estimating the stretch is almost like a lost art. <laughs> Um, and, and I'm sure we could get that into other podcasts, but the wheel, like you said, is great for, you know, a company officer can be like, Hey, how far do you think it's from point A to point B? How much hose do you think you'll need? And, um, you know, you can actually get real world numbers, um, to see, um, what the stretch is. Or I've also seen pup companies use like uh, twine or rope and they mark it off every 50 feet like uh, inch and three quarter hose or two and a half hose. And they take that places and they stretch it, you know, places they can't stretch actual hose line and uh, use that as a drill to estimate the stretch, which is kind of a lost art in the fire service, if you ask me. But um, cause we're, at least my department, we're pretty reliant on 200 foot inch and three quarter pre-connects. That's what we pull off time and time again. So if you don't make an effort to, to practice the stuff you do once every 10 years or maybe once a career, you know, when it's time to actually estimate the stretch and uh, make longer stretches, you're not going to be prepared for it. Um, I did want to go back to what you were talking about. If you ever get a chance to mask up unknown in a hostile environment, I want to throw this to Big Juicy because uh, I think – there was a lot of lessons learned. This is an anniversary. This week was the anniversary of a fire where a couple guys in your engine house, right? Big Juicy, uh, you know, uh, obviously before you were on the job and all that, uh, 
you know, they got jammed up. They, they, uh, uh, I think we can say at this point, they made a couple mistakes that we probably wouldn't make today, taking the elevator to the fire floor, but they were instantly put in a hostile environment and, uh, really being able to mask up with your gloves on in a uh, shitty environment, as Chad was talking about, became the difference between life and death. So, Juicy, I'd love to hear being beings where you're at in the house where this happened, kind of explain the story and tell us why you think that drill is important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm assigned to Engine 7, downtown Memphis. Uh, April 11th, 1994, we lost two firemen uh, to the Regis Tower fire at 750 Adams. That's an alarm we make at least once a day. Uh, that particular day they made that call, uh, I think they said they made that alarm 30 times in the last 10 days, automatic alarm came out. This time they actually had a job on the ninth floor of a 10 story building. Uh, not to blame or point fingers, but they were ill prepared, uh, very complacent. It was 2.30 in the morning. Uh, so a lot of things were stacked against them in the way they were operating. And uh, two civilians and two firefighters perished in that fire. And uh, it's changed some things down here for sure. Um, but me being a new guy that arrived out of the same firehouse and the same seat that those guys lost their lives in really makes an impact. Their name's on the side of my pumper. And uh, I'm going to keep their names uh, honored and remembered why they gave the ultimate sacrifice. So uh, a couple things that I've been doing, we have a brand new guy in our house. Uh, he's had three shifts and then our whole house got quarantined for 14 days and we go back tomorrow. So it's been fun kind of training a new guy, uh, showing him a few things. Um, but we've been doing some driver's training for another guy on the rig. And uh, one thing I want to be when I'm working is the guy that can count on whether it's bumping up to drive or getting moved to the truck or whatever. So I was a big component of knowing the job in front of you. So uh, we've been doing a lot of driving training. And one big thing working downtown is spotting FDCs. You know, can you spot the rig where it's only a 50-foot section or do you park where it's now a 65-foot stretch? Getting proficient on everything we do, whether it's an alarm, turn that alarm into training if it's a false alarm, walk those stairs, see those uh, stairs or the return stairs, scissor stairs, take your high-rise packet and stretch it. Then you get to stretch your pack and you get to reload it. You made a nice little drill of a call that got you out of the house since we're kind of quarantined right now. And you can do all that work uh, technically on a call. So, and then usually when you get an alarm, it kind of gives you a, an all access pass to that building. So do a little exploring, do some recon. Recon is huge in our job. Um, if you can grab one of those measuring wheels like Chad brought up and figure out if your 150 foot hose pack will reach to the center of that building from the standpipe stairwell. This is stuff you want to know before that building is on fire. And that's what kind of happened. The Regis fire, uh, ill-prepared to an alarm they went to all the time. So uh, get out there, get, turn that call into alarm, if it's just a false call. And uh, don't be afraid to do it 2.30 in the morning either. You know, that's the thing. Uh, we train all different times. Calls come in all, all different times. So train in the dark, train in the daylight, and uh, be prepared to work. That's what it kind of comes down to. That's awesome, Juicy. Uh I just want to make that that huge point for especially people uh, that have ladder trucks or quints or, or whatever you got. You know, when you go on these automatic fire alarms, are you throwing ladders or are you, are you putting your outriggers out? You know, positioning like it's on fire, treating every run like it, like it's a fire. Um, that that's some good advice. Um, you know, we got a couple other uh, company officers before we, we turn this into a firefighter level thing. Um, Kelly Foster, you, you're a company officer. What are you doing with your guys? Some good drills, uh, tips and tricks. Love to hear from you. Uh, you come on all these podcasts and uh, we don't hear much from you because you're a pretty quiet guy. I'm taking, it, I'm taking it all in, learning lessons, mouth closed and ears open. So, yeah, so, lately, you know, like, like everybody said, like things been really crazy, and uh, for the most part, um, all the outside activity shut down. We allotted some discussions on some uh, line of duty deaths, just like the discussion uh, we've had. I was able to use that lesson learned from that that particular call that we just spoke of. With I had a uh, a guy from a different shift ride over and was had a little different approach to an automatic alarm than. We normally do, and uh, I was able to use that that call 
and bring up that information and sit down and have a, have a chat about it. It seems that, like uh, when you can put it, put it in a lesson in context with real meaning behind it, that that's when those uh, training opportunities really stick with those guys. But I, I think that there's a real opportunity out there now to, uh, since we're kind of all stuck inside, to, to really research uh, all these line of duty deaths. I mean, there's through the fire service history, almost every day of the year, there's there's been a line of duty death that's happened sometime throughout our history, and and it's easy to to kind of sit down and, and kind of look ahead and see when your shifts, the dates are, and kind of line those dates up. And if you have nothing going on, be able to have that that information ready to sit to talk about it and learn those. Things. We just lose we, Jeff all together. I think so. You know, and one of those things, and I think kind of go back, uh, Chad was talking earlier on something with masking up with your gloves on and everything else, sliding the helmet down over the arm. You know, that was one of those things too that uh, whenever you start to practice that and messing around with that, you'll find that most of your standard SCBA straps, sometimes that can be difficult to do. Uh, so you might have to actually, you know, look at your equipment, what you're carrying. Um, there's ways to modify it to make it to where it's more proficient for us to use. You know, you might get the longer ST or the, the longer helmet strap makes it easier to slide down over the top of your arm and then actually bring it back up over your, your face piece. Um, so whenever you're doing some of these trainings, you know, something as simple as go out and practice putting your, your gear on that a lot of times we take for granted, go out and do it. And then whether have somebody video you where you can go back, you know, just real quick, pull out your, your camera that you're able to make a phone call on and take a video of it and go back and watch it and find some of the little things on there. Um, even with some of the stuff we found as we do training with some of our people, you know, look at what's in your pockets of your gear and why do you carry that and why do you carry it in the manner that you do? Don't just throw a bunch of shit in your pockets because that's more stuff that you have to lug around and carry around. Um, what, what's functional to carry in your pockets and do you carry it in your pockets in a manner that you can get it out. Go back to what Chad was talking about earlier, get in that totally darked out room to where, and then all of a sudden deploy something out of your pocket. See how much other stuff might fall out. Um, you used to see people all the time when you go to training classes, people would carry a piece of webbing daisy chained in the bottom of their pocket. And you, you get them in a darked out condition and tell them, well, deploy that. And they had no clue. They would sit there for two to three minutes trying to get a piece of webbing out of their pocket. It's not functional like that. So go back whenever we start talking about stuff with fundamentals, go back to your turnout gear and all these things that we're kind of talking about. There's ways to, to modify, um, to make it, to make it where it's a lot more user friendly for what you're trying to accomplish. Hey, uh, when it comes to the webbing, you hear me? Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. Yeah. You're up. Okay. Uh, when it comes to that webbing, Paul and I got, uh, got to use that, had to use that for that line of duty death we ran a while back. Anyway, um, uh, I think we were both fortunate that we practiced with it, trained with it, and, and we both settled on, and this isn't the end all be all, but uh, basically about 20 foot webbing with a knot tied permanently in each end uh, uh, and hooked onto a carabiner that, that's unlocking. So that way, when you just stuff it like a rope bag into your pocket, find the middle of that loop with the beaner in one hand and the end, the end of the 20 foot piece, which is gonna be 10 foot long, shove that down your pocket until you get to the beaner and then clip the carabiner inside your pocket, but on the edge. So the carabiner is on the outside edge of your pocket. You can find it with a gloved hand. And, and we did, and Paul did. He was able to reach down there, grab his carabiner, pull it out, and it's already in a loop. Now, if you wanna girth hitch it, you just take it within itself. If you need 20 foot, you know, you can manipulate that with a gloved hand to get one knot off that carabiner and you got a straight 20 foot piece if you want it. It gives you a lot of options. And I think most options for worst case scenarios, we're gonna be using it in a loop. So that's how it stays when it comes out of the pocket and we're able to find it and get to it. I got are you guys hearing me? I had to turn off my, turn off my um, I guess I was still with 35 people or whatever, 32 people. Slowing my internet down, but um, 
I was – I have to agree with what you said. I keep mine in a loop. The only thing I do different is I actually roll it, um, and then I, I put a rubber glove on, and I keep it rolled up in a rubber glove. Uh, I still clip the carabiner on the side. You grab it, you know, flip it out. Um, I think most people are using these um, – they're webbing uh, to drag people. So you may not need a 20-foot loop. Uh, you know, Paul, Chad, you know, Tim, myself, we also could have to use our webbing to make a hasty harness or some, or some, some rescue operations. But uh, there's people out there that make shorter webbing loops that are pretty fixed. Uh, shameless plug for Jared, if you're on here, um, with your company, you may, you make a, uh, webbing loop that's pretty fixed. That's pretty nice. Um, you, you kind of, it's a personal choice. You got to figure out what length you need for your job and what you're, you're going to do with it. And, um, you know, kind of buy accordingly. Um, Jared, uh, I assume you're still on here. It's kind of hard to manage all these people, but Jared, um, you're a company officer. I'd also like to hear from you some of the company drills you're doing. I, I know you posted some pictures a while back of, throwing ladders at the engine house, but what are you doing with your guys during this uh, company level drills uh, during this quarantine? Event? Uh, all right, all right. You there, Jared? I see him, but I don't hear him. There you go. Yeah, I'm not hearing him either. All right. Well, if he could, if he can get back in, I know he said he was having some internet problems. Um, you know, so let's let's kick it to the. Uh, we got any other company officers out there? You don't have to be one of the instructors for us or or a burn or anyone. Uh, I know there's several guys from the area that I see on here, uh, Terre Haute or different places that are company officers. What are you doing with your guys? Anybody? Got hey, anything? Jeff. It's it's David. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, hey, Dave. There you are. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, you're, okay. you're still a company yeah. officer, unless you got yeah. demoted. That's cool. Well, I ha I'll find out when I get back from my four day if I am or not. But um, yeah, there's a lot of that. You know, uh, I'm kind of like Chad. I like to give some outside the box training, some different stuff to really kind of throw the guys off, think through the problems. Um, like, not too long ago, we had a brush truck that I backed on top of Rescue Randy. I had him bunk out and then uh, come out and you know, solve the problem. They were totally off the wall with it. They had no idea we were doing any of this. You know, he starts the time, time clock. I said, all right, guys, you know, time's wasting. Anything I can Anything. do that I can, you know, throw them off to make them really think outside the box to, to get them something a little bit different. And we still hit the basics. Um, we do timed air, you know, as far as masking up on air who's the fastest whoever's the slowest cooks and cleans that night for dinner so little incentive for stuff like that and I'm very fortunate I have a very good crew uh, they're really good about keeping up on the basics very proficient um, so anything I can do like stretching lines kind of like what Chad was talking about you know really not just stretching lines but making it a challenge um, one thing we're really working on now is masking up with gloves on uh, that's a huge thing. Uh, that's kind of like starting all over if you had never done it before. It takes a ton of practice to get it right and not get it wrong. Uh, one of the other ones that we were really working on uh, was just some communication drills. Uh, we got guys who really like to hear themselves talk on the radio. Uh, so I bought a, it's like a 125 piece Lego set and I could have go to chief's office and have him have the directions, then I have the Legos out in the bay for one of the guys, and they have to explain how to put it together piece by piece. Uh, so we want, you know, just the minimal communications and, and to be able to communicate that message. And that was a big lesson learned. A lot of the guys had no clue. Um, that's just some of the simple stuff that we do out there. Uh, like everybody else, we're kind of really antsy to get out and about. So if we have a chance to go on a call, we try to turn it into a training. All the way there, uh, we're doing scenario-based stuff on different structures. You know, if this was on fire here, how do we attack it? You know, just make anything you can into some sort of training. 
that's awesome stuff. Uh, you know, uh, like I said earlier, the to me the best way to get good at masking up with your gloves on is to practice it in the morning when you do your morning chin. You know, 10, 15 times a day. After a month or so, it's going to be second nature. Um, yeah. um, I, I would like uh, – Jared, I see you're on here now. I guess you uh, guys fix your internet connection. Uh, what are you doing with your guys' uh, company-level drills during this pandemic? Uh, yeah, we've got several fun ones. Uh, the masking up with the gloves on, that's kind of a go-to for us. Um, we switch it up and uh, we race. So before we do it, we pick a target. So the target may be, uh, you know, through a window, bailing through a window or up a flight of stairs or whatever. And then we pick a, not a punishment, but a, I don't know, whatever you want to call it for the, the slowest person has to do something. So whether it be burpees or whatever. Um, and then we incorporate the same thing. We call them off the rig drills where we come off the rig we force a door, we have to get our normal complement, force a door, down on the ground, live fire layout, full mask up, and go in the door for a search, and then time stops. And it's all time, we make it a competition. Um, same thing, we come off the road, we do the same thing with uh, BES. We've got a, a prop, a two-story prop, and we're lucky to have that. So we'll actually put a, a guy up there, and then we'll come off the road, single person DES, so you've got to get the tool complement and the ground ladder. You've got to get around, go in, find the victim, hang the victim out the window, and then we bring them out. Um, search, we search inside the station a lot. We'll go out, gear up, have the other guys mess up the station and then play victim, and then we come in and find them, and then we switch. Um, we do a lot of stairwell rescue stuff, actually. We do victims up and down stairs, and then we do firefighter rescues up and down stairs. Um, there's really a whole lot. I've got a whole list here of, of stuff that we do fairly regularly that's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, I was cracking up. I don't know if anyone's watching Jared's video, but your guys behind you, every time they drink, they drink at the same time. It's like they're synchronized swimming back there. <laughs> they're on a timer. It's a, it's a timer for drinking. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, let's go. Uh, somebody, mentioned, somebody mentioned something about communication drills. Um, not sure what all radios uh, everybody's carrying out there. We carry those Motorola's. Um, and uh, where we find out, uh, come to find out, I mean, Chad can touch on this. He's actually had to call Mayday, um, or a Mayday, here not too long ago. Um, you need to you need to go over a mayday drills on these on these uh, radios. Uh, I know a lot of them have a, a mayday button on them. Every uh, should I don't know if everybody does, but uh, I know ours do. Uh, one on the lapel mic, one on the radio itself. Um, but a lot of people may not realize that when you, when you hit that button, you only got about ten seconds of priority there, unless you keep the unless you keep your uh, your mic pressed, uh, you you'll lose priority after about ten seconds. And that's something that we uh, we try to hammer into everybody, uh, especially the new people coming in, getting proficient, because they're not getting that training in the academy as much as we thought they were, um, because they don't have the radios. They don't have the radios to be teaching a lot of these new, these new people coming out. So um, we we had somebody grab the ICM once to pretend it was the radio to call a mayday, and we're like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, well, "I'm calling a mayday." It's like, "Well, you have a radio. Use the radio." It's like, oh, so the train, the, the train habit was ingrained in them to grab the ICM instead of a, instead of a radio. So um, that that all added, you know, you you, uh, you play how you practice, and it really comes through, uh, especially with a lot of new folks. Um, so really, tr training the maydays, and we try to tell people, you know, I, I don't I don't care so much about who you are. I just want to I want to know where you are first because uh, if something happens with that radio after that, then at least I know where you are. Um, so we try to ingrain that into them. Um, where are you? How many of you are there? And what's the problem? And so um, do Mayday drills. Uh, get familiar with those radios and how you carry them. Oh, geez, how you carry them. There's so many different ways to carry them. 
Uh, I carry mine in on the inside of my coat, uh, try to protect that cable as much as possible. Um, some people carry it in their pocket on the outside, and they end up losing the the, the, the radio a lot during during basic drills. Um, so really, really train with your, your radios too, because that can end up being a lifeline. I just wanted to just wanted to mention on that just why why I was here. It was just a forefront uh, of my thoughts because somebody was mentioning communication drills also. So. Uh, that's a great that's a great point, and and I like you know I'm not getting into the, the radio strap non radio strap debate. You know I, I wear a radio strap, Tim. Tim rigged up something to where it's on his pants and it's under his coat, kind of like you were saying, Paul, but not, not a radio strap type thing. Um, but kind of, I know it's a bit off subject, but Chad, if you don't mind, cause uh, I totally forgot about it till Paul mentioned it, but uh, that's a good story on the importance of how you carry your radio, why you carry your radio and knowing how to call a mayday because uh, Chad, if, if you'll share your story, uh, you, you end up getting pinned up and stuff pretty good to where yeah, how you can um, your radio really mattered. I'll try to make it quick. So we had a house that was, uh, uh, if we'd have pulled up on the backside of the house, um, I, I imagine the initial report would have been fully involved, um, but we pulled up in front. So uh, we do what Kansas City does great, uh, uh, inch and three quarter through the front door like every fire we see. So that's what happened, even though the back was on fire. Uh, from the basement to the uh, second floor and attic all the way up. Uh, they took those lines in there as a, as a safety officer. I did a 360. I prepared to go inside, follow the crews inside, call for resources, keep command informed of what's going on. I get to the front porch. They're not making progress. There's two lines piled up on top of each other, one of them flowing. We're really good at advancing lines, standing up, no matter how hot it is. And then we even turn around and run out with them. Um, uh, I think we need, we need to train on getting down. We need to train on once you open that nozzle, don't close the nozzle. And I, you know, this is, I'm speaking about my job. You know, you don't open, close, open, close, open, close. You, you decide to open it, open it and make an attack. Uh, um, so I get to the front porch, spend a lot of time there. Two or three guys come out. I see two of them stumbling, missing helmets and stuff like that. Disoriented looking. I grab them. Uh, pull their hoods off. I see their ears are burned up and they're, and they're a little startled. Um, so I notify command, we're going to need EMS for a couple in the front yard. And then I face to face say, Hey, uh, we're going to need another plan here real quick. And I can't find so-and-so. So we call everyone out and uh, one guy doesn't come out for a while. Um, if so much time went by, I went to the pump operator and wanted him to, to work the pump to determine if the line, the nozzle inside was flowing or not. And uh, I got a blank stare. So I went back to the door and, and ordered everyone off the porch and said, if someone doesn't go in there, find the nozzle. And this guy, I'm doing it myself. They went in there. That guy came out. They were all good. Um, the, less, the first lesson I learned there, and I've learned it the hard way two or three times in my career, when things don't go right, uh, you need to completely reevaluate that structure and that fire and what you're doing, in which we did. We called everyone out and we flanked it, so to speak, with a couple lines from the back, knocked it all down, then we went back in. But so much burn time had happened. I don't know if I had done anything different, but that's every time I've had a house uh, collapse kind of catastrophically, which usually they're not catastrophic. But when it has happened in a catastrophic way where it caught one of us or took one of us down with it, it's usually because we had a failed attack for whatever reason. And um, so we go back in with two lines. I end up upstairs as a safety officer, making sure we have lines, communicating with the man. And uh, there was a step down into the back room. Well, the whole back of the house was added on for two and a half stories. And after they knocked the fire down, I, I decided to go past that step to, to open a back window and search a bed that hadn't been done. And the whole thing collapsed mm -hmm. into the basement. Uh, uh, you, have that, you have that few seconds where you lay there. I did a mayday. Actually, I declared a mayday right away because I saw a reflective gear next to me. I knew someone else was there. I knew that the main fire attack was taking place underneath me. So my, I was really concerned about the people underneath me. I didn't feel pain. I just felt entrapped. So um, I called the mayday, told them where I was, said we need to get accountability to everyone. 
and then started working on getting myself out. And me and the guy next to me got ourselves out within a, within a couple minutes. Um, on on upon reviewing that May Day, and and this this brings the drill in that I would do. On upon reviewing that May Day, as I listened to it, um, I, I realized that I didn't hit the emergency button. I just grabbed the lapel mic, keyed it, and declared my May Day. So I first thing I thought is why didn't I hit the red emergency button? And the first thing that came to my mind is I couldn't get to it. I couldn't get to the red emergency button because it's on top of my radio, right? I completely forgot because I don't, I had never trained for it that I have the red button on top of my lapel mic, which I was able to get to. So I've never pushed that red button on top of lapel mic, uh, nor has almost anybody on my job, no matter how much time they got on. So when I realized that in my head, I took my guys for a camera drill. They all, whenever we drill, we go with full turn. We go, I tell them to bring everything like they're walking through the door of a fire. I don't care what the drill is, bring everything <clears throat> like you're going through a fire because if something's going to go wrong, I want you to learn it now. So I told them we're doing a thermal imaging camera drill. Went in halfway through, they step through a floor. I jump on their back. I like, we already went to a, a training channel. I was like, give me a mayday. Six guys, nobody pressed the red button. Not one person. I did it with a couple other crews. Nobody pressed the red button. Ask them why when you're done. And most of them will say, I didn't want to startle dispatch or I didn't think about it. Nobody's training to push the button, or at least we aren't. Um, so then we redid it. So now you know what we're doing. We're standing here looking at each other. Give me a mayday. And they pushed the button. And if you didn't know this because you haven't done it, I knew how it worked. I knew that when I pushed the button, I had radio preference. But when you push that button and you get your 15 seconds, you key it. At, when it times out at 15 seconds, if you haven't done it, what you won't realize, that sound you get when you key it, when you press the red button and you key it, you won't get the sound. But you will get that sound 15 seconds later when it times out. And your muscle memory, your muscle act reaction in 15 seconds when you're not done talking yet is going to make you let go of the key and rekey it. And you just lost radio preference. If you press the red button and then grab your key and hold it, you'll have it for on most radios for up to a minute, depending on how they programmed them. No matter what, you'll have radio preference for a minute. You can probably get everything out you need, but that takes some training and some practice. Um, and nobody, nobody on our job knew that. Uh, we had an after action review of that. And I asked who had done a May Day and uh, nobody had. I had asked if anyone ever practiced it. Nobody had, including all the chiefs. I asked if anyone ever hit the red button. Nobody had. And uh, I said, I think we've identified some problems and we've done nothing about it. So the company officers can do that. But um, so set up another type of training and then just surprise your guys and see if they do it Don't with, without even being prompted to. Then you can go into that, uh, into your May Day stuff. And like Paul said, um, I, I don't even get into the acronyms anymore. If you look at real, it's like bailouts. When people bail out, they're jumping out head first. They're not doing a little, they're not doing a cool arm swing thing. If I'm doing an arm swing thing, I'm not too worried. Uh, when people bailing out, going head first. Uh, when they're doing a mayday, um, you'll be lucky if they're not screaming. The last mayday, uh, Paul and I had another, had a mayday. And, and it, you know, those people are in fear for their life. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be maybe unreadable and screaming. So all I, all I want them to say is where they're at. Then if they get their shit together and they can tell us more, cool. But forget the acronyms, just key the mic, mayday, 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 I think I'm here or I am here. And don't even worry about anything else. They're gonna tell you more. But you just want that to come out first. So that's awesome and uh that's great information. So um when you roll that collapse down, you guys were pitting in. Uh <laughs> I think the craziest part about all that is uh, brother was brother the actor guy in chief. Yeah, he was. And he did something that we kind of learned from there, too. He heard the collapse. I mean, everyone on the fire ground can hear when part of a house, a good amount of a house collapses. And and we've had a couple of Mayday since then, unfortunately. But we've learned to don't jump on the radio as soon as you hear that Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Uh, and even when the person stops talking. Give it a couple of seconds. There, for one, there might be more than one mayday. Somebody else 
in a different part of that house may be trying to do a mayday. Uh, uh, and for two, that person may lose radio preference and be getting back on to give you vital information. So as an incident commander or someone in charge, uh, Matthew paused, seems like forever, but as, as, the, as the IC, he waited about probably 15, 30 seconds after everyone, after I did a mayday and someone else said it collapsed and, and a few other people got their two cents in of, of valuable information, uh, then he decided, okay, we're gonna address the mayday and we're gonna do it like this. It gave him time to digest the information what, and probably run around to the back and determine the extent of this mayday since, since, a, since his eyes on the back of it would help evaluate that situation and that particular situation. But anyway, that, that was something else we kind of learned. Uh, don't be too eager just because you're incident commander that you got to jump on the radio and say something. That kind of applies all the time. So I guess that would just fall under the category of generalized uh, radio discipline. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, uh, so, so we can uh, kick it back to, at least in my mind, who matters most. Um, let's get to what are, what are some of the firefighters out there? Yeah, sometimes you end up, uh, end up with company officers that don't want to or won't facilitate, but there's, there's plenty of uh, uh, water boils from the bottom up, so there's plenty of uh, drills we can do at the, the firefighter level to get stuff moving. Um, haven't heard from uh, my buddy Mike, Mike yet tonight, so I'm going to kick it to Mike, and uh, let's, let's talk from the firefighter level. What are drills you're doing, Mike, or we could do um, to make us better at our job? You guys, uh, you asking me there, Ron? Yeah, Jeff? Mike, Mike okay. Torres. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I couldn't hear you. I apologize. Um, no, we're we're kicking it to all the firemen now, the most important people on the fire ground. Yeah, we are. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, there's uh, there's these are all good drills. I like I I think somebody said it earlier. I apologize. Uh, my kids are running around, so I I'm trying to juggle them as well. Um. But basics. Uh, I do. We do a lot of stuff with your gloves on. Uh, everything's with gloves on. Uh, I learned at a young age by my mentor how to do everything. With gloves on. I, didn't know, I didn't know there was another way. So let's just put it that way. So when people started doing this, this shit with the, the long straps and all these cool videos, it's cute. I just I didn't know any other way. When they started doing that, I was like, oh, this must be a thing. So like I said, everything was just with my gloves on, regardless. He said there was no other way but this way. So I said, okay, fuck it. Let's just do that. So I learned just everything with my gloves on. Um, I never not have them on. Um, there's been instances where not having my gloves on could have caused us a problem, and it has caused people problems. Uh, that one quick grab of raw iron to rip it off, to grab that kid or that woman kind of dangling out the window or just holding the door open, stuff like that. It, it, that's simple. I think that's something we can all work on. It's not complicated. Um, SCBAs, we, we check our SCBAs every day. Every day, it's uh, either the 0800 checkout with the MSAs. Uh, since the MSAs now have a timestamp, uh, our department makes sure we randomly take our packs off the rig, uh, pick a company, and see if we do our 0800 checkouts. Um, it's, uh, you know, it used to be a 32-point inspection or 26-point inspection. Now it's it's down to a little bit more with the new G1s. But uh, regardless, we got to turn them on, run through the checks, know everything about them. Uh, Chad killed it with that stuff. I mean, that's huge. Um, we do a few things. Um, <laughs> we practice with uh, garden hose. Uh, I've seen a couple of good engine companies practice with garden hose. Uh, the reason why they're like, if you can if, if advance a garden hose up and down stairs, an inch and three quarters, be no problem. You won't have any kinks, no problems. And I've seen some extremely good companies do the drill, uh, passed on from some senior guys and get the job done with no problem. And it's pretty amazing. It's actually extremely hard. Um, ladders, we have, uh, of course, I'm a big advocate of tying off that clovage. Uh, it's a simple, easy drill. You can make it in the firehouse. You can do it with your gloves on. You can time each other, race each other. It's a simple thing you can have set up in the firehouse. Um, I, I think we get away from doing simple rig checks. 
Uh, people are like, oh, that's not a that's not a drill. That's that's just something you should be doing. It's a little bit of both, um, and it's also a little uh, a little thing of company pride. Uh, for some reason, I find I find that you know rigs are they look like shit. Uh, those beds look like shit. Um, you know they they're paying attention to detail, their attention to detail. Yeah, they clean the house pretty good. Blah blah blah. But why is it that you know they spend so much time cleaning the the, the house up? but the rigs are all, you know, in shambles. There's a good story um, uh, Chief Eddie Enright had one time. Somebody wrote about him, and uh, he went to one firehouse to another firehouse. One firehouse, man, they had their uniforms on, crisp, clean, looking great. You know, they were sharp. Everything was tucked in. Man, they were they were looking good. And Chief still made them do drill and, and you know, kind of gave them a hard time. He drives to another firehouse somewhere on the south side, and uh, – these guys got flannels on, white socks, you know, looking like scrubs, smoking cigarettes in the kitchen, just belligerent. Belligerent. Just garbage look. Garbage look. But you know what? But you know what? The rigs were phenomenal. They looked great. They had, you know, hose beds were, you know, astonishing. The ladders, the tools were clean, sparkling. The hand cans were beautiful. He's like, later on, the guy asked, you know, why didn't you give these guys a hard time? They weren't, you know, they weren't in uniform, blah, blah, blah. He goes, I know that that company's going to go to work and their shit's squared away. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the other, you know, meatheads that look like shit, you know, or they dress all good, but they're hiding something else. So checking out the rigs, you know, that's a drill. You can do that every day. That's a simple thing. Um, I like to do some drag and carries in the firehouse. Uh, communication skills are huge. Um, I'm just kind of speaking around here. I think in my head, uh, anytime you move somebody, stop doing this one, two, three shit. Uh, the, the, you aren't Riggs and Murtaugh on fucking lethal weapon. So stop it. All right. Nobody knows if I'm going to go on two, where are you going to go on three rigs? Nobody knows. How about like uh, ready, ready, go, uh, have some terminology. So we know we understand we're all on the same page. For some reason we can't get on the same page and we look like shit when we do it. Um, a rip pack. These are just things I'm spitting out because it's on the top of my head, and these are simple things you can do. Um, I found it difficult with uh, doing the rip pack. I throw that rip pack on, and you're dragging through the, uh, you know, whatever burn tower through the firehouse, and you're like, oh, I pulled my record time. I dropped the mic. Fuck yeah, I'm done. And the, the face piece is all like on the side of the guy's head. He's been out of air for like, you know, the entire revolution. So there's really no point of you doing that. You're doing, um, guys, 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 Simple trick, a piece of paracord, uh, they latch it on, they do like a, what do they call that, a, uh, what kind of wrap with the paracord, or with, um, shit, who's the rope now, who's the rope guy, with, with, around the fucking, uh, with, um, Jesus. Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. yeah, yeah, that's it, thanks, shit, sorry, you just fucking go around it, and then you tie, that's on the hose on the face piece, so when you're dragging them with the rip pack, you're dragging the rip pack which is attached to like their coat. So you're pulling their coat and you're not pulling their face piece. That was the simplest thing. fucking ingenious. I was like, you guys, you gotta be shitting me for how long I've been doing this drill. And I'm like, fuck, that's the easiest thing I can possibly think of. So, you know, simple stuff like, simple stuff like innovates simple things by just going back and bending the wheel, but doing the basics. Like I said, anything with your gloves on, oh, I'm not gonna, like you said, I'm not going to get into the whole radio strap deal. Um, I'm a big advocate of wearing my radio strap. I wear it underneath my coat. I have a little, one of those little janitor things, but I'll tell you what, fucking, I, I can't stand it. And this is just a pet peeve of mine because I know our guys do it. They wear it. And this thing is like a limp, like just kind of like dangling like this, just bouncing all over the fire ground. Like, so all willy nilly. They're like, oh, I know where it's at. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I know where it's at, but I've been calling you for like five minutes, you know, or the chief's been telling you to hold the roof or the, hey, chief's been telling us to get out. The reason why is because it's direct. Have it close to your ear. I can hear everything coming through my ear. Uh, I'm a little deaf in this ear, but it's just a little food for thought. We got to be a little bit more professional when it comes to things like this. Like something like that, just like a soapbox, radios, having them dangle, not having control when you really need them and be real addict, uh, very good at using them with your gloves on is kind of huge. I mean, you should know what radio channels are, what, where you're at. Uh, I know for ours, Maine's one, two's Englewood, all the way uh, four's um, Fireground. 
I know every municipality is a little different. I get it and I understand. Commands have to have two radios. I got to monitor this frequency with that frequency. I get it. And my part time job, part-time job. Um, I totally understand that. And respect that. that. Respect that. Um, that just means um, you have to be that much better for doing that. You know what I mean? Um, I'm trying to think of something else. Drag carries, uh, Ritz. Those are some other ones. Some other ones will come to me as we talk. But I don't ever like any in house drill, especially now with what we're, what's going on. Keep them simple. Your everyday bread and butter, simple stuff. You get it down to a science, which nobody does. I don't. I don't have it down. You know, I still got to practice this stuff. Um, then you can move on to some more intense things. The what is it? The high frequency shit that we don't do, or low, or whatever the fuck you call that. Uh, start working on that stuff. And that's different. You know, definitely get to that point. You know, it's called professional development for a reason. For a reason. You know, but. If we can't get to the basics, stop running. People can't walk. They're already running, sprinting to the next thing because that's the next big thing out in the training circuit. Stop it. If you can't do one simple thing, don't go fucking over here. Stay at your level. Do you get that done? Then we can move on, you know? So, sorry, my soapbox. It was all building up. No. Can, can, we, can we just not tie the flies off and move on? Stop it, Chad. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> hey, so Chad and Mike, I remember you guys beefing about that tying the ladder knot when we were all in Milwaukee te teaching with uh, with our bodies up there, you know, to the take the, take the door guys. I, lo I love it. It's I I have the reasons. Like I always said, I, always said why I do it, and that's not a big deal. Has, they have only the only reason why I bring them up is because they happen to me, and I love it. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I'm not, has there been a time I haven't tied it? No. <laughs> I can see where I don't do it, like where I'm like, ah, screw it, I'm just going to move. Like, uh, I don't, don't fully extend the 24-foot ladder. Yeah, I'm not going to tie it. I'm just not. It just, it's dumb. It's just, I'm not going to do it. But if I have it, I, I have it tied before I even think about it. It's just because I'm a creature of habit, and it's just what I'm used to. I don't know. It, it's ingrained to us in that academy. I mean, it literally is burned into our brain. Do this. Boom, 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 boom. And it's always been simple. We were talking about this in the firehouse. I worked on second shift, which was two days ago. Uh, um, they were talking, we were sitting down just talking how we look at the book and how, how CFD, I mean, your guys' departments are the same way. The book is so wrong and so messed up and we've been doing it. Our departments have, have gotten it right for years. Got it right for years. And why are you trying to reinvent the trial? I mean, it just it works. Why are we screwing with it? You know, we were just, we were shooting back and forth on, you know, if we like using the, on our, on our engine, our, we have the, uh, the beds, how they're set up. Uh, that's how they're set up. Uh, gate valve. I was talking about how I hate the gate valve. It's on a two and a half, an inch and a quarter shutoff pipe, you spin down, and then you have the gate valve. Well, everywhere else I've worked, I've only worked at another firehouse before the one I'm at now, we've never used it. Like, that was the, you want another line? Get your own fucking line. Don't hook up in the Don't hook up in the arms. Here at my new house, we different. They're like, "Hey, different. the garbage line, welcome." And now we got another line. We go to the second floor because we got fire on too. I love it. I think it's wonderful. So it was a learning curve, but I see where I didn't like it, and now I have to be more accustomed to it. And it's actually pretty cool. Um, we have, seat, you know, seat assignments obviously because we have the manpower. But you know, I always hated being on the hydrant. I'm like, oh, they're like, "Hey, you're detailed to the engine today. Oh, great." And they're like, hey, you're on the hydrant. Well, that's even a double spot, right? But being on a hydrant, a lot of responsibility. You got to get the guys water, right? Um, and the odds of you getting more work or grabbing a second line are pretty large. So that's why I'm like, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> second line, you know, bless you, Jed. And Thank you. I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, it's wonderful. Um, on a truck, I like going, you know, guys are like, oh, the roof is the most sanctuary place to go. And got, we're, I like going to the rear. That's a big thing for us. So I'm always training in my head. And I try to tell guys when you get to that spot, that's more of like uh, your guys' OV, maybe, maybe your outside vent. Um, so it's a, I would say a guy that's seasoned, a guy that's seasoned and has patience, patience. And has calm, and, and, and any kind of, you know, you have to put a true operator in that spot because you don't want them to screw anything up. It's very, you know, you don't want to 
on windows for no reason doing anything crazy. So having a true, a really seasoned operator on that position for an OV is huge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, mm -hmm. I think going to the rear, you're by yourself. You're by yourself. You want them to be, you want them to be, what I need to do, have some self control, get back, get, back, get, back, you know, get a view of the, uh, get a view of the uh, seaside. The, your officers aren't always going to get that three, it's not going to happen. You're going to get maybe two sides and we're going to work. It just, it is what it is. If you've got a guy that's going to walk around, I've had it. But sometimes that building's like two blocks long. I mean, what are you going to do? Just get the visual, boom, move on. That's something else you can do in the floor. Pull up to a bully. Hey, guys, boom, give me a size up of that. Let's bring it back. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. You put pictures on the screen. You can watch YouTube videos and just say, what would you guys do? Boom, boom, boom. And it sparks conversations for hours. Shit, I went too long. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm going to shut up. No, you're you're good. You were breaking up at the end. And I think uh, that's... Uh, probably doesn't matter, right? <laughs> uh, no, no. I think it's an important part. I think we can all agree that I think Chad mentioned it earlier, you know, the, the first few companies may or may not get a look at the back. And what you were saying at the end is uh, somebody needs to look at that C side of the building, the back side of the building. And uh, the bigger the building, the more important that that becomes. So um, whether it ends up being a firefighter or later riding a uh, company officer, you know, you need to relay that information to uh, other people operating on the fire ground. So, um, Trey Johnson, you threw out there water uh, boils from the bottom up. Uh, but speed of the leader is speed of the pack. You know, that's pretty good because uh, I've been involved. I've been blessed in my career. I've always had great captains. I, I, I've never had a bad captain. Um, now, I've been around some bad captains uh, in the house with me or companies in the battalion or whatever, but I've never had to work for a bad captain. So, um, but absolutely. I think the, the point of what Trey's saying is there is firefighters can drive change in the department. And, um, you know, uh, big juicy and I've been talking a lot. I, I'd love to hear his input at company level drills or, or just anything on this subject. Uh, before we we bring it back in and to some other people, uh, what are you guys doing down there down south, uh, Juicy? Uh, you doing anything different during these times, or, or what's your input on uh, from the private level, uh, firefighter level, company level drills? You know, we've been trying to just hit the basics. Uh, like I said, we got a brand new guy to our company. He's got three shifts in, so we're just going over. You know. We catch a high-rise alarm. This is the pack you're taking. This is how it works. Let's break it apart. Let's repack it. Here's how it deploys. Stuff we can do on the bay floor. Um, one thing I want to kind of touch on real quick is uh, I think uh, Dave talked about timing his guys and that sort of thing. You have to have that clock running, maybe not for competition, but if you say, hey, I need you guys up to the eighth floor to stretch this line, you need to know how long it takes you to walk up eight stories and stretch that line. It might be six minutes, and you're in your mind, it's going to be two minutes. Oh, I can do this real quick, whatnot. Uh, if your chief is giving you, hey, you guys got five minutes to get this taken care of, or we're pulling you out, and the task takes you seven minutes to do, you need to have that in the back of your head um, and be realistic about it. I see so many times in training, uh, and Chad touched on this too, is we're taking a line in, and we're opening the nozzle, shutting the nozzle, moving around. You got to spray water, put fire out, keep that line open, keep it flowing. And in training, you got to do that because you're going to find out some of these guys might have the grip strength, the technique, whatnot, to hold that line open for two, three, four, five minutes while flowing water, which it takes to get that fire out. So uh, those sort of things, take the drill and make it Don't just stretch a line and open the nozzle and say you're done. That's when the real work starts. So Take that time to figure out what your time to get that task is and uh, apply it to the task you're given over the radio. That's stuff that you have to have in the back of your head as a firefighter and as an officer. Uh, we get a lot of detailed officers in right now with all the pandemic scares and people off sick and whatnot. So if you got a guy detailed into a high rise company and he's not used to working high rise, you're the firefighter has to tell him, Hey Lou, this is going to take a couple minutes to get this job done just so you're aware. Um, don't be afraid to kind of 
explain your knowledge to them when the time's appropriate. Don't question their authority, but you might be the expert on your company now if you're the only one assigned there because everyone else is detailed in. So be brave enough to have that knowledge and express it as a firefighter. That's where I think a lot of people will find that transition from just a private new guy to the senior man to an acting boss. So take all that knowledge and, and keep it tucked away, but don't be afraid to share it to the new guy in the company or a detailed officer, whatever it may be. So you guys are still performing at your peak performance. Hey, and, uh, you know, I'm, we can all blame whoever, you know, it, it all comes down to personal accountability. Like I can blame my captain or this captain where I was subbing, we call it subbing or, you know, there's a captain on an overtime, you know, that shouldn't make or break your company. If the foundation is there and you get an overtime captain in, riding the seat, or, you know, it, it, either your company's good and, and the members of the company are going to take pride in what they do and, and train and drill to get to the level they need to be or they're not. Like, it, it shouldn't matter who's in that seat, you know, uh, I take a beating because I said uh, to my captain, who's great, I said one time, like, hey, we're all kind of our own captains type thing. And all I meant by that is you got to take responsibility for your own actions. And if, if you have a great captain, and Chad, sounds like you're driving your guys, taking your clothes off and making them search and all that, like, that's fucking awesome. And, you know, my captain – uh, pushes training and all that stuff, but there's a lot of captains out there or lieutenants, wherever you work. Uh, we have all captains on my job. So that, that's what I know. But, um, you know, when you, when you get there, uh, you, you push, push that and you can, um, hold on. <laughs> so, Hey, look, look at everyone. Look who came in here. Mommy has that uniform. No, no, no. no. You're live right she now. obviously gets oh. her looks from her mother. Yeah, absolutely she does. But she woke up from her nap. So um, my point being is, you know, you, you, you got to be your own person. You know what you need to know. You know what you need to do. And uh, either you're going to work to get better or you're not. So uh, I think the whole point of this conversation is getting better at what we do and, and coming up with company level drills and I, I'm a firm believer in, and I didn't make this up it, it was all from um, Aaron Fields and all that water boils from the, the bottom up you know and if the privates are thirsty and, and we're pushing to get training you know somebody's going to step up to that level and if, if you're an officer and you're not helping your members out you're not feeding the, the privates underneath you uh, the information they need to know, then you probably shouldn't be an officer. I mean, uh, and I'm a firm believer. Everyone on here is solid as can be or else you wouldn't be spending your own time on a podcast. So um, before we go in a circle, anybody got else, any other company level drills, any questions, uh, we, we've been going for quite a while now, so we could start start bringing on in. It'll, it'll take a while to end it, but we have uh, 30 people on here or whatever, so I'd love hey, to answer some questions. Question. We got? Hey, Jeff, I, I want to say something. This is, is props to you. Uh, this is one of the first times I ever met you. We were doing a training at the lake, and uh, you kind of took a guy that was struggling and took him under your wing and partnered with him to four scores all day. And I think that's a big part of the job that we all have to do is take care of each other. And you see a weak link, whether it's on your crew, your department, at training, don't be afraid to take that person and help them out. I think uh, there's some mantra out there that you got to be the best and always be working with your A-team or whatnot. But we're, we're a crew as a, in general. And uh, when you did that, it showed a lot about who you are and your passion for training and pass that along. And I don't want guys to forget why we're here and what we're doing, you know. So uh, props to you, and that's why I think uh, – you're, you're a good person to lead this and not trying to fluff you up, but that was very uh, humbling to see that. And, uh, and that's what I think this job's all about. So I, I, I can speak for, I could see all the names. I assume you guys could see it too. I can see everyone on here. And um, I think,
think we're all in here to make the job better. And, and I just speak for St. Louis, you know, where Tim and I work. And I, I just want to leave the job better. That's, that's why I go teach classes. That's why I lead trainings. And, you know, it's good to come on to stuff like this because sometimes you can, you can get beat down for caring. You know, a, a lot of people don't. And it is what it is. But, uh, yeah, I hope at the end of the day myself – you know, engine house training, I could speak for, for them. I could speak for O'Burn, I think, um, you know, we, we all just want to leave the fire service better than we found it. And uh, I'm a firm believer that, you know, the privates, the junior guys kind of drive the direction of the future. Um, the captains and the chiefs and, and the lieutenants, the people above us are, are only going to react to how we present ourselves and what we want to know. I mean, anyone got diff some a different perspective, some different dad. I, I can only speak for my limited experience where I am. But if if a bunch hey, of Joe. privates come up to our captain and say we want to train, he, he's going to make it happen. Hey Jeff. Yeah. Jeff. Hey. Uh, yeah. One thing I've learned is that uh, sometimes I, I, I hesitate to even say this, but you could be over aggressive with training. You can wear guys out. Uh, you know, and uh, so my expectations are uh, just, you know, in general, a couple, you know, an hour or two a day to make ourselves better at, at, at something to do with the job on top of taking care of the station, doing paperwork, CEUs, whatever else, cooking, everything else. Um, uh, if I can just get an hour or two from those people. But sometimes, you know, you have new guys and there, there's a big learning curve. There's a big catch up, you know, if you get someone right out of the academy. So, uh I think it's beneficial that um, maybe not your whole company needs to spend um, two hours learning how to mask up when your guys, you already have two or three competent guys. So uh, as a company officer, uh, I think that also comes into play for developing new company officers. Um, and it was very hard for me to do. You can ask my guys, but I'll, I'll ask one guy to teach another guy something. And then I got to go lock myself in the room or I will interfere and step all over that guy as he's trying to teach something. Um, but I think that develops both people in doing that, and it gives guys a break. Not everybody needs to be out on the apparatus floor training for six hours of the day. Um, anyway, that's something to keep in mind. We'll break it up. We'll get a new guy. I say, hey, you're going to do this with him for a couple hours. That new guy's going to be busy all day long. But, you know, he's going to be busy with this guy for a couple hours, this guy for a couple hours, and these two guys for a couple hours, and then maybe I'll have him after dinner. Um, and that way, not everyone, you know, who's got 10 years on the job, who put that kind of time into training already and have a certain proficiency level, you know, they, they don't need to do that. You know, they can spend some time, you know, cleaning up their bunk room, studying for the next promotional exam or smoking, smoking the ribs. Yeah, and I can't, I can't speak for you, Chief, and I can't even speak for my captain, who, who's pretty similar to you in a lot of ways, but, uh, he wants he wants all of us, you know, Tim included, to be where he's at. Like, if you're not empower as a company officer, if you're not empowering your guys to train or teach when appropriate, or uh, you know, move up and advance. Okay. I mean, yeah. you're kind of fucking all the people under you, and that's kind of opposite of why you got promoted in my mind. Um, not not really to get too far the away from the subject, but it went where it went, and that's kind of my opinion on it. I'm obviously not a com company officer, but I worked around some good ones, and uh, they all seem like you, Chad and uh, Gary, and there, there's a bunch of you on here. You know, they they want to empower the guys underneath them to get better. So, you know, one of the things we really haven't talked about too much today, and, and Chad kind of started alluding to it with your new guys, you know, whenever you get that new guy in your crew, uh, you know, you may have to refocus a lot of your training to really upon that person, uh, depending upon how your academy set up. I know everybody that's on here, there's a little bit different, whether it has, you know, your city academy and it's, it's based around your procedures and what you do within your organization. Um, you know, kind of like within our area, County Academy, it's basically a separate run institution, 
that whenever these people are coming out of it, they know nothing about your organization. So whenever they come into your organization, they don't know any of your procedures. They don't know any of your SOGs. They don't know anything that of how you function. So you have to essentially go back and retrain the person. The other disheartening thing that we're starting to see in a lot of these training programs is when you go to some of them to help with whatever class it is, you're seeing the faces of the people that were in like one or two classes before them. So all of a sudden you have this new person that was in two classes before them that are now teaching the brand new people. But what do they have as far as experience coming in of what they can teach them? What they're teaching them is directly out of a textbook. They can, they can stand up there and recite the textbook, but they're not giving them anything as far as any real field or any real life experiences of what they're going to see whenever they go out there and actually have to handle an emergency. So essentially, whenever we're getting some of these new people, depending upon how your system is set up, some are a lot better than others. You know, you're having to retrain them whenever they get there. So your company training is focused kind of around your new guy. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, um, so before uh, I got a lot going on with text and all that, um, we, we've been going for a good amount of time here. Um, I'd like to open it up to like some questions and answers to um, people out there. And I, I know, Tim, you posted something, so I'll kick it to you, Schultz. I'd love to hear what you, you, you have to say, and then we'll open it up to anyone else, uh, all the other guys that we haven't heard from. Questions, answers, comments, uh, drills that you do that haven't been mentioned. Uh, I mean, that's, that's why we're all here to share knowledge and ideas and uh, the goods and bads about what's going on right now. So Schultz, let's hear from you and then uh, we'll go from there. I've just kind of been taking a couple notes as we've been going through all this stuff. Uh, one of the things I thought of uh, that I don't think anybody's think mentioned, anybody's yet mentioned yet. is, uh, you know, we, we take lines we off and we, and we throw ladders and we do all this stuff. Uh, forcible entry. Once you get some of that down, um, you can trim down the space you have to work in. So now we're trying to throw ladders, but we're trying to throw them in a gangway uh, with power lines. Now we're doing forcible entry, but we've got some objects behind us and we've got some other uh, tighter constraints that we're working in. Uh, same thing with leading off lines. Uh, rather than pulling lines in parking lots and doing things like that, uh, now we can work on doing those in in loading docks or in the engine house with some obstacles and some things like that. So those are some great ways uh, that you can take what you're already doing and, and try and operate within some tighter constraints. Uh, when it comes to the drags and carries, uh, you know, dragging a guy across the engine bay floor is one thing, but dragging a guy over actual obstacles, um, dragging him over, I think I lost my, Jeff, can you still hear me? If you want, you're probably playing with him. Yeah, I hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, you're good. All right. So, um, you know, in, I don't know where I cut out there, but the drags and carries, you know, dragging somebody across the engine bay, bay floor and dragging somebody over obstacles, um, two completely separate things. So, so maybe uh, having dragged somebody over a, a sideways table or over – uh, so large hose bundles or something like that is a good way to spice that up. Um, and let me see what else I wrote down here. Perfect. Oh, and, you know, as Gary said, there's more and more people out there um, that are, are teaching without that uh, experience. Uh, feel free to, to go seek out people with those experiences. Um, you know, taking some a lot of the classes that will burn an engine house and all these people that – People with great life experiences like Chad uh, are out there and accessible to everybody, but you have to take it upon yourself to seek those things out. Uh, so don't sit on your hands and wait for them to come to you. Seek those things out and, uh, and make it happen for yourself because there's, there's tons of good stories just that I've heard today um, by getting on a Zoom meeting on the internet. Uh, so, so take the initiative and do some of that stuff on your own. That's all I got. That's all. 
Hey, that's a good point. Um, on your drags and carries, and one thing I haven't done yet, you guys hearing me? Yeah, we got you, Chad. Yep. Uh, one thing, uh, the person that Paul and I pulled out a couple weeks ago, um, it was a narrow set of attic stairs with two hand lines on it. And uh, so, uh, find, yourself a set, find yourself a set of stairs. He, he just mentioned throwing hose in the way. That's a great idea. Uh, put a couple charged hand lines on it. Now drag somebody backwards down those stairs and see if you end up standing up by the time you get to the bottom. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, Chad, I mean, we had mentioned this, but next week we're going to come back. We're trying to get, you know, you, Paul, Juicy, the, the other burn guys. And I, I want to do search next week. And, and part of that's going to be victim removal. And we can get more in depth into that next week if uh, we can make the schedule work. But, um, you know, I think we've we've covered a lot tonight, and it's been uh, it's been really hard today. It's been really really good. Um, so I, I do want to before we totally wrap up, um, we have a lot of people we haven't heard from tonight that are watching and and have made it this whole time. So anyone got any questions? All right. Well, you know, I've got another question, if that's all right. So. Oh, hey, we're here for you. I mean, that's, all right. that's why uh, Engine House will burn. That's why we're here. We're here for, for people like you, Anna. Well, uh, you know, it would be interesting for me to hear what some of uh, some of you guys are doing as far as fitness goes. Like, my gym is closed. Um, I primarily strength train, and I've not been able to lift heavy because the only time I have access to equipment is when I'm on shift. And obviously, I can't lift heavy because I need to stay functional. Um, you know, I kind of organized a, a running group uh, we ran this morning. Um, killed it, by the way. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I'm just interesting, uh, interested in knowing what some of you guys do um, if you're not able to maintain your normal fitness schedule. Yeah, anything you can do is better than nothing at all. I mean, even if you're using body weight or something, and I can kind of speak a little bit freely on this because I'm coming off of an injury and I actually spent six months where I couldn't do hardly anything. Um, but even if you, but even do, if you, do, you know, some jobs you know, with, with push-ups or something, you're, you're keeping yourself functional and keeping yourself moving. Uh, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, I know one of the things that it might be a little bit further than what you're looking for, but some of the things we found is like sandbags um, around the house, uh, at, around the firehouse. You can use those functionally to, you know, emulate. Might not be the same as doing a heavy lift, but doing some uh, – some stuff with keeping them functional with dragging hose, dragging victims and, and just keeping yourself limber. It just mm -hmm. daily stretches or anything. I think probably, uh, I don't know for anybody else that's on here, but even Tim could probably go in a little bit more detail on some of that stuff with the fitness. But if you're doing something, it's, it's a lot better than doing nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would have to throw it to Tim because all I'm doing is wearing my mask in my house. So I don't eat it all day long. <laughs> <laughs> So, Tim, yeah. what do you got for us, brother? This is this is in your wheelhouse, not mine. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of a, a, a PT dork, I guess. I've done a PT for the City Fire Academy for the last uh, probably five classes or so. Um, I've got 16 weeks of uh, workouts that they can do with just a sandbag. That's really the only prerequisite, and that sandbag is great. Uh, you can get a lot done. Uh, and, and really in times like this, I think uh, it, it's all about keeping the wheels on, kind of like Gary said. We're not, we're not going to be looking to set, you know, new, new deadlift records and, and new squat records, but we want to we kind of maintain the status quo. Um, I was actually training for a 50K, and that 50K has now been canceled, and that's all kind of out the window. So I was doing a ton of running, uh, but I, I actually – I used to own a gym at one point uh, and I haven't had a gym membership in, in years. I just work out out of my house. Uh, I do my strength training when I'm at work, um, pull-ups, push-ups, squats, sandbags, kettlebells, and I got a fan bike in my basement. Um, and if you have the discipline to get up every day and do those things and actually wear that equipment out, 
then you can kind of start looking at the next steps. But a lot of people, uh, it's, it's not a lack of equipment. It's a, it's more of a lack of discipline thing. So, um, just, just stay moving and, and you know, have fun with it. Go start something new, go ride a bike, go, um, you know, do some more running kind of like you said. So, um, just, just stay in the game till, uh, till everything goes back to normal. Cause long-term this is all going to be short lived. Yeah. Those are excellent points. You know, uh, my, my, me and my other firefighter, we actually did a full gear on air, um, uh, sandbag workout last shift. And so we sucked face on our, you know, in our gear. And so that was, intense but good um another question i've got is you know i've been reading a whole lot um especially with the quarantine that's going on so what are some awesome book suggestions uh that i can get from you guys it could be self-help could be about building construction um just anything something that comes to your mind where you're like this is a great book this is what i learned from you know man uh let's see i got it i got it right behind me actually uh david david goggins book uh, lights out. It's, it's an awesome book. It's a great perspective on some things. Uh, a lot of mindset stuff. I also just bought uh, Jocko Willink's book. Uh, he's got three really good ones out. Um, they're all, they're all really good. Oh, I was reading I love it this him. morning. I was reading <laughs> Actually, it this morning. Yeah. So I finished this. Um, I think it was my last 48 off and I woke up the next morning and I just started it over. Um, it's absolutely incredible. It's like looking in a mirror um things that i can improve on so, yeah, uh, no so without you gotta check out jo uh uh david goggins book online that's really good um if you're lock looking just like good reads about firefighting i have it with me uh last man out sitting here i've got that one <laughs> yeah re report from engine company 82 uh those are pretty good like you can learn stuff but they're also uh enjoyable reads uh i got the other one around here somewhere but, um you know uh you can't go wrong with the jacko willing stuff uh there, there's a lot of good books out there so i recommend figuring out something that interests you and in, in google that and reading and try and get better during this downtime uh, the big one I think that is huge in the fire service uh, is uh, building construction. Anything with building construction, uh, I got to write it here. You know, anything Brannigan's building construction yeah. in the fire service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, his big thing is know your enemy, and the enemy is not fire, it's the buildings and how they break down under fire. So, the uh, short of being a uh, carpenter, which Tim is, and now I am not, you know, um, you know, you, you need to learn everything you can about how buildings are built and more importantly, how they behave when they're under fire load. So uh, that would be the books I would recommend. Uh, how about you guys down there, Chad, Paul, you, you guys in, in Kansas City uh, on the, the uh, west side of the state, what are you guys reading? Hey, Jeff, uh, we're rescue guys. We just do audio books. <laughs> I'm right there with you, man. That's the best thing ever, especially David. Otherwise, Gar otherwise, Gar we, otherwise we take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been uh, – uh, I've read most of those or listened to them. Um, I use my time. This ties into working out. Um, I've got up to where I'm doing like three to five miles almost every day, and I will uh, – uh, got tired of listening to music for that amount of time for an hour every day. So uh, I started listening to Goggins and that stuff. And then I started downloading audio books um, just to try to feel like uh, uh, that's my time. That's, that's my time for my brain to get away and do nothing. And I feel like it's more productive that way, listening to some of that stuff. And, uh, and, and then to touch on your point on the buildings, um, absolutely. I was fortunate enough to be a roughing carpenter for several years, and I realized the value that has on the fire service, my role in the fire service. I try to take that on to everyone else. You kind of got to be able to get out and see it, um, to do, get familiar with all the different types. But the biggest danger I see for us in the fire service um, is, is the new construction, for one, that we're already, most of us are aware of, whether you're a carpenter or not. But two, is that all these older neighborhoods 
that a lot of us who work in inner cities are comfortable fighting fires in heavy timber construction, older balloon frame stuff. We know the hazards. We know what we're dealing with. I'm starting to see those uh, a three story heavy, heavy timber and, and uh, masonry building and they rip the roof off and they put those, you know, lightweight, whatever you want to call them, silent floor joists or something up there. So when our roof guys get up there on this working fire and they think they got all kinds of time, they got nothing holding them up. Um, so the mixture of different building constructions is what scares the hell out of me. Um, besides the new stuff, but I, we go into that knowing that. That's um, that line of duty death we had a few months back. Uh, um, that that's that was not knowing the building. Yeah, it was. It looked like a ranch house. Ended up being like a double wide mobile home that was really nice. Put on a foundation with a void space underneath the foundation. So it was beams on top of beams on top of beams. Big void space, fire boiling with particle board flooring and two foot center. So when you fall through that floor, you're going all the way to the basement like he did. Um, then I doubt they knew their building construction. I didn't until I took a good look. I did a full 360. We already had one, one guy down. So I wasn't going in that building until I did a full 360 in this situation because multiple attempts had already been made and things had gone wrong. And that's when we ident identified the type of structure. So anyway, I think I touched on the stuff that came to my mind with what you said. No, I, I appreciate that, Chad. And down the line, I think next week we're going to do something. We might take a couple of weeks, weeks off, 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 come back and do some uh, writ type stuff, and that'd be an appropriate time for that. But, you know, here here's the thing with books. If, if they don't interest you, you're not going to read them. Like, if it's not something that's important to you, you're never going to read if it's something you like, something that's interesting, you read the whole thing in a few days. And if it's something that's assigned to you or pushed on you, you you may or not may or may not read it or just hit the cliff notes. So uh, at the end of the day, like there's a ton of good stuff out there, but I think you need to kind of reach out and figure out what's what you like to read. And uh, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. I started listening to the book or I listen to Jacko's podcast a lot uh, that goes more into depth in books and you know there's a ton of stuff out there that's not even fire service related uh, you know uh, Jacko podcast for instance talks about the Sag uh, Chronicles which is about the uh, special forces guys that did the black ops in Vietnam and stuff and, and I read it because it's interesting to me, and I'll and I'll read it all. And it's got great leadership lessons. Uh, you know, someday I hope to be a leadership in my organization. Uh, God willing, I will be. But either way, it's going to be a benefit to the people that are around me because I can learn from that. So find something you want to read, read it, and, uh, and and stick with it. Finish it out. Finish it out. With that being said, that being said uh, we got some other comments in here. I'll read them, but does anyone else have any other questions? Nothing. Nobody wants to unmute yourself. Put yourself out there. Come on. There's 20 people on here. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, Chad, what do you got to wrap up? Chad, Paul, anybody? Uh, let's wrap up company drills, and uh, we'll come back next we'll come week. Back next week, we'll ask you. But let's, let's see what our guy. Uh, I was just I was looking around my garage, uh, teaching forceful entry, teaching th through the lock. Um, I'd never done it on my job till a few years ago. I finally have actually done it at a fire, which you know it's not always applicable. But uh, trying to figure out how to go through the lock and not have some truck guy reach over my shoulder and bash out the glass um, happen to be ready. We talked about gear today some, and I found these at a gun store. Those things there. Uh, I tried making them myself. In quarantine, that'd probably be a, a good something that could, you could do, but uh, it took way too long. For me to try to figure out but anyway 
this is what you'll see hanging out of the pockets of my gear because one is hooked to the through the lock tools. So it's hanging right out of the side pocket and I can get to it easy. Um, those I got, I got at a gun store. Uh, one of them's hooked on my forceful entry wedge. Um, so you can find them with a gloved hand hanging out of your pocket. It doesn't really create an entanglement hazard. Uh, and you can buy a bunch of this stuff and make these kind of things at the station real easy. Awesome. Awesome. Next. Good talk. Now, Chad, Paul, I appreciate you guys uh, going to uh, scary. Uh, any, uh, anybody else got anything to uh, wrap up? Hey, real quick, uh, a good mentor of mine from TV, Ron Swanson, said, uh, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. So apply that to your training. Always give it a good, uh, heartful uh, endeavor when you're doing your training. And for uh, the reading thing out there, shameless plug to uh, FDTN's Fire Magazine, 48 bucks a year, no fluff, no advertising, just articles about stuff that uh, applies to us in the real world every day. So, hope everyone gets out there and gets some training during this quarantine. And uh, Chad, your mom's still hot. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, the fire department training network. I haven't been fortunate enough to be up there, uh, taking class up there, but I've heard nothing but good things. So, uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, anybody else got anything? Hey, with all that being said, hey, thanks. Um, we had over 35 people at one point today. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I thanks for joining us. Um, you really, if you're not getting the training you want, you need to look yourself in the mirror because there's so much information out there. There's so many good people out there. You can call, call any of us at Engine House, anyone at O'Burn. Call Chad. You know, pick their brains. Call Torres out there in Chicago if you're you're in the Windy City. Uh, if you're not getting the training you want, it's on you. You know, whether you're a chief all the way down to a junior firefighter. Junior firefighter. Uh, there's the there's resources, the resources out, there. out there. Today's day and age is the best that's ever been in the history of the history. Uh, so with all that being said, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule, uh, even though it's not that busy because uh, everyone's stuck at home. Um, and I thank you. I look forward to uh, next week. We'll be back next week, hopefully, with the uh, guys from a burn talking about search. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. And with, with all that being said, we'll see you next week.